Good morning from Portland, Oregon. My name is Barbara Steinberg. Welcome to the webinar, uh, School is Closed, Now What? I am thrilled that more than 375 parents and educators are joining today or will be watching the recorded version of this webinar. I've put a lot of time and energy into gathering resources and providing parents, especially with some knowledge on how to support their children while schools and districts across the country are trying to figure out how to support our students best. At this time, I'm actually going to share my screen, turn off my camera so that you can focus all of your attention on the content that I've prepared for you today. And we're off and running. When I first learned um, that school was closing and I was responsible for providing um, school at home for my own two children, I felt a little bit like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. I was lost, um, I was a little bit panicked, and although I have years of classroom teaching experience, teaching your own kids is totally different than teaching other people's kids. So for that reason, I want to do a very quick shout out to every educator watching this today for everything that you have done, everything that you'll continue to do to support our children's learning. I know that here in Oregon, things are evolving day to day and adapting to those changes requires flexibility and all of us as parents appreciate all of your efforts. I wish that this yellow brick road would lead us back to school, but it looks like we might be doing school from home for the remainder of the year. And as I mentioned, while our schools and districts are figuring out how to implement remote learning, parents such as myself are eager to use this time and um, the resources out there are plentiful, but figuring out which ones to utilize is often overwhelming. And like I said, there are lots of resources. This list here is from Amazing Educational Resources, and it truly is amazing. So many companies that have charged subscriptions for their services have made them free, but to comb through this list and figure out what to do is something that many of us don't have the time, the knowledge, or the patience to do. And so I have done that um, for all of you. Now, what I've chosen doesn't mean that it's the only or the best, but because there are so many options, I have selected one or two that I'm gonna bring to your attention today. And then if you feel like you need something more or it's not specific enough for your child, then I can talk about what we can do for that um, specific need. My advice as you watch this webinar is to take a sheet of paper and jot down um, what your action items will be. If you've taken a workshop with me, you know that I pack a lot into um, every single workshop and this webinar is no exception. All of you will receive a recording of it and you might need to go back and rewatch certain parts but I hope that by the end, this paper will be full with things that you can do that maybe before you didn't know about. I've divided mine into subject area, which I'm going to address, what my action item will be, and then of course, any notes that um, might pertain to that specific area. Before we jump into content, I want to talk about um, my overarching goals for this webinar. Um, my very first goal is to help you help your child mitigate learning loss while school is closed. I'm sure you know that there's this thing referred to as summer learning loss. And that means that because during the summer months, many of our kids are not engaged in educational activities, we get this summer slide. And when kids come back to school in the fall, we often have to spend some time reviewing to get their brains working again before we can teach new content. Well, this is perhaps a very extended school closure. 
when direct instruction may or may not be taking place. And one of the goals has to be to keep students' brains active and engaged. My second goal is to help you to use this time as an opportunity to fill in gaps in your child's learning. And I realize that this may not apply to every student, but for me, I've personally discovered huge holes in my own child's math skills, and it's the perfect time to work on this. And again, part of my goal in this webinar is to give you resources that don't involve you being the teacher. The third goal is cross-curricular learning. Now, not all classrooms have four walls. In fact, some of the best learning occurs outside of the classroom. Likewise, not all subject matter can be compartmentalized into chunks. But for those of us who send our children to traditional schools, we know that subject matter is compartmentalized into chunks. And so I'm going to be presenting the subject matter as such but I'm going to be using what I'm gonna call a top-down, bottom-up model to balance how much we determine kids learn and what comes from kids learning themselves. My last goal is to ignite a passion for learning. Um, that's not to suggest that our children aren't passionate about learning while they're attending school, but now is a perfect opportunity to allow our children to be more active participants in determining what they learn about. Because at the end of the day, learning is the goal. Now let's go back to that cross-curricular learning I referred to. And I said I was gonna use a top-down, bottom-up approach. Now when I say top-down, I'm referring to instruction that is prescriptive. And what I mean by that is it's very skills-based. It's driven by a teacher or a parent or a caregiver where I'm going to say, today you are going to learn about. A perfect example of content that should be prescriptive is math. We can't just randomly teach math concepts. It needs to be built from the bottom up on a strong foundation. Now, if we contrast prescriptive top-down instruction with bottom up, that's inquiry based it's driven by children's interests, it is often project-based, and in a perfect world, we're gonna have a balance of these two. So as we move through the content portion of this webinar, I'm going to suggest ideas that are both top-down, bottom-up. And because I'm speaking to a large range of grade levels, a large range of parents who have different amounts of time to devote to their children's teaching, um, I realized that this is not going to be a one size fits all. But like I said, my goal is for you to walk away with an action item or two or three or four that you can implement during this time when schools are trying to figure out um, how to meet each child's needs. So we're actually going to start with math. Now, as you know, I am PDX reading specialist but I actually had to teach math for 10 years as a fourth and fifth grade teacher. And math can be divided into two categories, conceptual understanding and computation. Now to understand a concept such as fractions is vastly different than being able to calculate the product of fractions. And our kids need practice in both of these areas. In 2008, this man, Saul Khan, started tutoring his cousin in math remotely, and a company was born, Khan Academy. Khan's mission is to provide a free, world-class education to anyone, anywhere. And although you can learn way more than just math on Khan Academy, we're going to focus specifically on math. The benefits of Khan Academy, which have not changed as a result of COVID-19, are that it is 100% free, always. Unlike many other educational companies out there that are offering a free trial, Khan Academy has always been and hopefully will forever be free. It's also aligned to standards. Now, 
of parents, this might be a term that's new to you, but we have a set of standards called the Common Core. And that is what our teachers teach to. And this instruction is 100% aligned to the standards your child is learning, regardless of where you live. The third thing about Khan Academy is it offers remediation support. It actually has a category under the title Math by Grade called Illustrative Mathematics that helps our kiddos who need an extra layer of support using more illustrations to grasp the concepts. And lastly, it has what's considered adaptive software. That means that if your child is not grasping a concept, it will continue to provide support until mastery is achieved. These four features make Khan Academy my number one recommendation for math support. Now, once you've set up your account, which I'm going to show you how to do in a minute, you're going to see the concepts your child will cover. And under each concept is a list of lessons, which are clickable. And those lessons are clickable to videos. Now you see here that I have two videos, titles, idea of division and fraction basics. And when you start this video, you end up with a narrated blackboard where Saul Khan or one of his teammates teaches you how to do the concept. So unlike a traditional workbook where really you, the parent, or you, the teacher, have to do the teaching, Saul Khan has flipped that on its head and given all of the instruction. I've muted it for the purposes of this webinar, but the way the instruction is delivered makes it accessible to nearly everyone. He really does a great job of reading the question to you, of using his highlighters and pens to be able to um, show you how to do whatever the concept is. And then a student is provided with practice directly related to that lesson. You can see at the bottom where it says rounding whole numbers missing digit, and it says CCSS, Common Core State Standard Math. And this is fourth grade. Now, these lessons also are shown on a dashboard. And this is one of the best features for both parents and teachers. Teachers, you can create a class and have all of your student data. And parents, you can have a dashboard that is just for your child or children. Now you can see which skills my child is proficient in, which ones he has attempted but needs more practice. That's part of that adaptive software. And of course, because I want to make sure that my kiddo is working, it also records the exercise minutes and total learning time. So to get started with Khan Academy, visit the website and click to create a free account. Once you've enrolled, I recommend having your child take the course challenge of the prior grade level. Now, the course challenge you'll find once you create your account with this little green monster down in the lower left corner. Why would I recommend that your child take the course challenge of the prior grade level? Well, because then we can find out where your child's deficits are and start working on those. When I showed you before, and here it is again, that this is the course challenge of a prior grade level, then I know exactly which skills my kid needs to work on, and they can just do those categories in that grade level band. Because mathematics is one of those subjects that builds from the bottom up, we want to make sure that we're building with a strong foundation and we don't have holes. And again, making you know lemonade from lemons here, I'm using this as an opportunity to go back and help my child relearn concepts that maybe he learned, he learned but didn't master in the prior grades. So in addition to Khan Academy, our kids need practice with computation. All math comes down to the four basic uh, computation of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And practice makes permanent. Now speed, isn't as important as being automatic. That's called automaticity. 
We want students to become automatic with math facts in the early years so that when it does come time to calculate large equations in middle and high school, students don't have to expend brain power thinking about the answer to a simple math fact. Now, there are free websites um, like Extra Math, and then there's also IXL, which is well known. There's a free seven day trial, and then it's $19.95 a month per child. But I highly recommend that you check to see if your school district has a membership, because if they do, then you can access that free online. There are also lots and lots and lots of free PDFs that you can download by just Googling free math fact sheets. So making computation part of practice every day is going to pay off in the long run, regardless of what grade your child's in. Now, once they know all their math facts, then you don't need to include this as part of your child's daily learning plan. The last area of math I wanna talk about is math in the real world. Now, math is obviously about numbers, equations, computations, and algorithms, um, but it's also about understanding and connection. And you should not only know what you're doing, you should know why and see it in the real world. So yes, cooking and building and playing games and creating, that's all math in action. And so when I say that learning happens outside of specific subject matter and beyond the walls of a classroom or a home, these activities should be counted as learning. And through conversation, we can embed math facts and math terms, and we can see our learning connect to real life. The question of how much time is something I said I would address in this webinar, but is also very specific to each child in each family's circumstances. Um, for an upper elementary student, I think 30 minutes per day of Khan Academy is reasonable and math fact practice of five to 10 minutes per day is what I would recommend. Uh, but every time I come back to this question of how much time for each subject matter, I'm going to always say that you know your child best and you have to balance their social emotional needs during this really challenging time for all of us with also um, supporting their education. So that wraps up math. And now I get to turn to my favorite subject, which is reading. Now reading is a big term. And the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that we read for different purposes. We read for pleasure, hopefully. We read as part of instruction. And in the primary years, we do word work as part of reading. And each of these has very different goals. And we're going to talk about them in isolation. All of them collectively make up what we refer to as reading. But before we talk about the instruction, we have to address how we read. With libraries and schools and bookstores closed, um, getting books into the hands of our students and children might be an obstacle. Furthermore, for students who struggle with decoding, with reading, access to audiobooks is a lifeline to the printed word. Now, when I say read, most of us get an image in our head of using our eyes to read. But I want you to imagine for a minute a book as a metaphor, a metaphor for a story, a metaphor for learning. And there are multiple ways that we can access that book. Why do most of us read a book with our eyes? Well, because if you're neurotypical, it's the most efficient. But for those with reading challenges, their ears are the best way to access a book. And of course, you can see here that I also put finger reading because if you wanted to learn how to read with your finger, you could obviously learn to do so. The point is this, it's not how we access the book that matters, it's the access that's important. And with that, I wanna share a variety of audiobook providers that have made their subscriptions either completely free or almost free. On the left side of my screen, you see three providers. And again, 
I could have listed every single audiobook provider here, but it would be a little bit overwhelming. Storyline Online, Tumble Books, and Vooks are all designed for the early elementary student. Their books are read by humans, they are animated, the text highlights as they're read, and for the most part, all three of them provide a basic level of subscription that is free. On the right side of your screen, you see Overdrive, Audible, which is from Amazon, and Learning Ally. Those three are geared towards the older student, provide all of the popular fiction and nonfiction books, and Overdrive, which is part of the library system, is completely free with Audible and Learning Ally being a subscription basis. If you need help getting an audiobook subscription, please reach out to us because I do not want access to books to be the limiting factor in students having the printed word at their fingertips. So now that we've addressed how we can gain access to the printed word, let's talk about those three categories. Reading for pleasure. If we want our kids to read a lot, then most of what they read must be what they choose to read. Now, how much time should my child be spent spending reading independently? Well, that really depends upon their grade level and if they have any other challenges like attention challenges. However, building reading stamina is a skill and it's a skill that can be improved. So if you need to start with 10 minutes and then slowly increase to 15 and then 20, then do that. But building stamina with reading is something that we have to work on from the top down so that kids can enjoy books in a, in a significant way. Now, one question I'm always asked is how do I know if my child is really reading? And I'll tell you, as a former classroom teacher and as a parent, there are lots of kids who fake read and they do it for various reasons. And I want you to consider something. If I asked you as an adult to write a journal entry after every chapter of a book that you're reading for pleasure, would you choose to read? Uh, the answer is probably no. So instead, I'd like to suggest that you engage in conversation, asking your children open-ended questions like, what do you think? Or what do you wonder? What do you feel? Instead of tell me what you just read about. Kids can create, they can draw. Obviously, kids who like to write can do so. Oops, sorry about that. But we want to be able to engage kids and have them share what they're reading about in a way that doesn't feel like it's punitive or it doesn't ask them to do something that they aren't good at, which is perhaps writing. But please, 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 if you do nothing else, make sure your kids are getting exposure to books that they have chosen to read. But pleasure reading, of course, is not enough to grow our students' skills and their knowledge base. Louisa Motes, who's a well-known reading researcher, has said that teaching reading is rocket science. And it really is. And it's why your child's teachers have received advanced degrees and certifications to do their job. And it really is unrealistic to think that we as parents can just step in and do the job of our children's teachers. But there is something that we can do. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite resources that I always share with educators, and it's ReadWorks. And ReadWorks has always been free for educators, but now it's also free for parents. The site is basically a collection of stories that include um, reading comprehension questions. However, it's the features in this toolbar seen here at left that make ReadWorks one of the best reading comprehension sites on the web. So I've broken this toolbar into two columns here. And if you have time, explore these different options. But I just want to give you the bare bones so you can get going. So the first selection you'll need to make is text options. 
I recommend selecting uh, reading passages. From there, you'll want to select which curriculum and supports you need or want. I highly recommend the question sets that accompany each article, and you might want the vocabulary activities as well. The curriculum and the supports are customizable for the needs of every single student, but again, these are the general recommendations just to get you going. Now you'll notice that the next box says eBooks and two boxes below that, human voice audio. Every single passage on ReadWorks has the option to be read aloud. Some are read by a computer. So if you just want a human voice, which I recommend, then select that box. For our young learners, the books are animated with text highlighted. So for that option, you can select eBooks. For the educators that are listening in, you can utilize these tools for differentiation. There are also collections for um, our English language learners and educators. If you need more support, I highly recommend you go to the teacher resources support page on the ReadWorks website. Now, once you've selected curriculum and supports, you'll need to select a grade level. Now, this is really important. Even if your child is a struggling reader, you should select their current grade level because the goal of this component of reading is comprehension. If your child is struggling with decoding, which is sounding out words, then have them listen to the article because this piece of our reading is about growing our language comprehension skills. So don't limit a child's ability because they struggle with decoding. We want them to be able to think deeply about the articles. Now, lastly, you can filter articles by topic. Some of the topics are content driven, such as social studies and science, and some are skills driven, like compare and contrast and cause and effect. My recommendation is to include your child in the process of selecting which articles they want to read once you put in the appropriate filters and depending on your ability to work with your child to provide instruction you can then decide whether to use some of the embedded skills and strategies to be able to grow their learning and their thinking around reading comprehension but at the very least if you select an article using these tools you'll end up with something that looks like this You'll notice the audio at the top of the passage, file, followed, of course, by the passage itself. The vocabulary and question tabs are near the top. And on the right-hand side, there are details about this article, including which standards it addresses, the vocabulary that's included. And when you click on this uh, vocabulary and the question sets, everything has the ability to be read aloud. The last area I want to address in this section of reading is what is called word work. Now, the reality is all students do word work, but in kindergarten, first and second, the teaching of how to read words, which is called phonics, is instrumental in helping our children become skilled readers beyond third grade. Now, once again, knowing what to teach or how to teach is a specialty. So the following recommendations take that into consideration. This collection of word work activities was actually created by one of PDX Reading Specialist team members. Um, and the workbooks are appropriate for all kindergarten and first grade students and for struggling readers in second and third. Workbook level one works on hearing sounds and words um, and developing the automatic recognition of letters and sounds. And level two is beginning phonics. As you can see on these sample pages, students complete activities such as um, finishing words with ending sounds, choosing suffixes, uh, reading decodable passages and answering comprehension questions. Again, all first grade students 
should be and would be learning these skills at school. Um, so this is appropriate for any kindergarten and first grade student, but also for second and third grade students who are struggling readers. You can purchase either a hard copy, which will be mailed to you, or the ebook, um, and both are available in our store where you can view more sample pages. But I also want to talk about older struggling students. Now, for those of you who know about PDX reading, um, our niche in the world of education is supporting the social, emotional, and educational needs of struggling students. And the foundational reading skills that many of these students lack are the same skills that are being taught in K-1-2. But the challenge, of course, is that most of those materials appear really babyish. Supporting older struggling students at home, the best thing I can recommend is something called phonics books. Now, when I first saw phonics books at a conference last year, I was determined to get these resources on my website so that people could purchase them. Now, let me tell you a little bit about them. If you are listening to this as a parent of an older struggling student or an educator supporting older struggling readers, these are decodable books. And a decodable book is much different than reading a book that is at a child's interest level or their intellectual level or a passage from ReadWorks, which has to do with content. Decodable books only contain patterns that a child knows. Therefore, there's no guessing. There are no words that they're not going to have known how to decode. Phonics books, um, like I said, are for older struggling readers. As you can see, the content here is captivating and we have heard from educators and parents that kids love these books. And there's a workbook that goes with each series that works on the foundational skills. And here you can see two sample pages. The first works on hearing sounds and words and the second works on spotting detail. There are game cards that accompany each series. So you can learn more. You can buy them directly off of our website. I cannot say enough about this product of Phonics Books and how well it does at addressing the needs of older struggling students. So those three areas should make up what I'm gonna call a reading block. Pleasure reading. 20 to 40 minutes per day, ideally more if you can, or if you have an eager reader, um, talking about that reading, but not requiring any kind of um, work associated with it, but saving that for what we call strategy instruction. For me, with my kiddo, I have selected with his help two articles per day, um, having him work on those independently, but then of course, being there to answer any questions. And then lastly, the word work. For our K2 students, 10 to 15 minutes per day, and for our struggling readers, 30 to 45 minutes per day. If you have specific questions that are for your child, then please reach out to us. Um, we will help direct you to a resource that will be more tailored to your individual needs. So, the last area I'm going to tackle is writing. Now, writing is not easy to teach, even uh, for teachers. And during a time when instruction might be limited, we definitely need structure to help our kids continue to grow as writers. However, uh, just like with reading, we want kids to have an opportunity to just write about whatever they want to write about. And I realize that many students don't like writing for a variety of reasons. So as a bare minimum, I recommend that you have your child journal about something interesting they learned that day or the prior day, but that that writing shouldn't be graded or critiqued for errors. It should just be a safe space for your child um, to express themselves in written form. But then to contrast that, 
with some degree of instruction. Now, again, we don't really know what remote learning is going to look like, especially at least here in Oregon. Um, but there is one product that I do recommend that at least is skills driven. Now, educators looking at this web on the right are very familiar with what is called the six traits of writing. Writing is a really complex process that involves all six of these areas being used simultaneously. But this product by Evan Moore, which is a daily six trait writing activity that should take five, 10, no more than 15 minutes for your child to complete, will work on one or more of these skills in isolation. Each of these books is um, aligned to the grade level standards. If you have a struggling writer, I recommend going down a grade level or two. And they are available um, on Evan Moore's website, but we will send a link following this uh, webinar via email where you can purchase these. And they have lots and lots and lots of workbooks, but workbook activities alone will literally kill your kids. So I don't recommend that but this is one that I do recommend you, you purchase. Once again, how much time? Well, for a free write, uh, no time requirement. I wish that my child would just sit down and write and write and write, but my child is one that says, how much do I need to write? So um, that is of course going to be individualized for each child and parent. But like I said, the daily six trait writing should take um, approximately 10 minutes. In that downloadable ebook, I recommend you buy the teacher's edition. It has the answer key, which is very helpful for you as a parent, so you don't have to spend time figuring out what the right answer is. So my very last section is probably my favorite because it's content area learning. Now, this is where I am 100% emphatic that we can learn content from a variety of sources. Learning is not limited to books. So let's utilize YouTube and podcasts and of course books, but um, I can send you lists and lists and lists of YouTubes and podcasts, or you certainly can Google them your own, but I've decided to just share two of my favorites so as not to overwhelm. So the first one is geared towards our younger students. Brain, Pro Brain Pop uh, used to be a subscription or was a subscription until COVID-19. They graciously have made it now free for everyone. It's a wonderful collection of animated videos on a variety of topics. And um, the website includes activities that accompany each video. It's, it's geared towards every grade level. They have a division of Brain Pop Junior, which is grades K2, and they also have Brain Pop ELL. So I have a kiddo get on, decide what they want to learn about, and it does not need to be aligned to whatever standards there are. It's completely driven um, by a child's interests. My other most favorite resource YouTube channel is TED Ed. And if you haven't watched TED Ed yourself, you might just find yourself watching alongside your child because it asks questions or has topics about some really, really interesting things. These videos are definitely geared more towards third grade and above. Um, and although they do not include specific activities tied to them, they are learning. Not all technology is bad. This is a wonderful opportunity to utilize technology as we try to do remote learning in school from home. How much time do you do this for? Well, that is up to you. And I realize we're all trying to balance our own work lives and just schedules. And um, this is not something that I can prescribe for you, but is definitely something that is a bottom up, which allows our kids to learn things that they are interested in. Again, over the coming weeks, I will be sharing more and more resources, but during this webinar, I had to be very selective um, because otherwise your head will be spinning. 
And with that, I will say that uh, we have covered a lot. And I hope your action item list is full and you have something that you can do today um, to get your kiddo going. And I want us all to remind ourselves to strive for progress and not perfection. And I say this to you as a fellow educator and parent, we are all struggling and trying to um, hit a moving target on a daily basis. But certainly professionally, when it comes to supporting especially struggling learners, if you're feeling like this, um, we can help you. We are in the office and can answer emails, phone calls, direct you to resources. Um, we are trying to figure out how to do things remotely as well. Our contact info is here. Um, if you have emailed and we have not had an opportunity to get back to you, it's because like everybody else, we're trying to keep our heads above water. And I hope that as everyone you know, stays healthy and sane as we navigate uncharted waters, may this yellow brick road lead us back to school soon. And as I mentioned, until then, I'm here to help you. My team is here to help you. So please reach out with any questions you have. Let us know if there's anything we can do to support you or your child. Thank you for attending and send us an email if there's something that we can do to help you. Take care.